Wait, so now that All Stars and Pocket 2 are out of the way, I actually need to start thinking about the position of these seasons? Man, this is gonna be tough. Hey everybody, welcome back to part 3 of our search for the best season of Total Drama. My name is Silly Billy, but you can call me Billy. In case you are unaware, this video is part of a larger 7 episode series diving deep into the different seasons of Total Drama and spin of the Redonculus race. If you haven't seen the previous two episodes, I highly recommend you go watch those first and then come back here. Cool, you back? Awesome! Last time around we looked at All Stars and the train wreck that season 5 was. But from here on out, I would consider all the seasons of the show good or better. Huh, <laughs> funny, the only two seasons with a shortened intro sequence are not in this category. Well boys, I think we found the problem. If we just have a 15 minute intro sequence next season, it will be the best piece of television ever created. Move aside, Breaking Bad! Total Drama, the intro sequence is taking the number one spot, baby! If you're new to the channel, well, so am I! So welcome to our little club! Since I can subscribe to my own channel, uh, could you do me a favor and do it for me? Awesome, thanks bud. No, but in all seriousness, if you enjoy what you see, please consider checking off that nice, big, juicy subscribe button. I'm really curious to the reception this series will garner, and since I'm making all these 7 videos beforehand, your feedback and support are both really welcome. Oh, and one final thing, everything you see in this and all subsequent videos in this series is purely based on my thoughts and feelings. We're going to disagree on things, but please be nice, we can have civil conversations in the comments. Look at this cute little ducky, could you be mean to this? With all that out of the way, let's not dilly-dally any longer and get on with... Number 5 Total Drama Revenge of the Island Total Drama Revenge of the Island is the fourth season in the series and one that innovates quite heavily on the existing formula. For one, this series is only 13 episodes instead of the regular 26, halving the total rundown of this season and making it the shortest season in the show's history up until then. It also retires the cast of characters we are used to and introduces 13 all new contestants. I think this season is pretty great. In fact, I went back and forth a couple of times on whether I like this season or the number 4 entry on this list better. Ultimately, I decided to place this season 5th, but don't let that take away from its level of quality. There's a big gap in quality and enjoyment between this and the number 6 and 7 on this list. Let me start with some mild criticism first. After 3 consecutive seasons of the OG cast, seeing all these new contestants feels a bit awkward. And this isn't helped by the opening of the season. I think episode 1 might be one of my least favorite from the season, and certainly my least favorite introduction episode to the show. We are immediately thrown into action and barely get the chance to breathe, let alone meet our new characters. The scene on the boat is pretty great. Each character gets one line of dialogue which tells us quite a bunch about their character. And Maria is sassy, Mike likes Zoe, Sam is an epic pork champ, and Brick is related to MacArthur. I guess. After that the boat gets blown up, the contestants race through the woods, they get put into teams, they play their first challenge and the first contestant is eliminated. All within the 15 minutes remaining in this episode. Especially when Chris says... This season of Total Drama will be a little bit different. For example, in every episode, someone will be eliminated. It gives a sense of rush that lingers throughout the entire season. Upon re-watching this season, this didn't bother me so much, but that is also due to me perfectly knowing who each of these characters are by now. On my first watch though, I remember feeling overwhelmed with the pace this new season took. And this brings me to my biggest gripe with this season. It should have been longer. The 13 episode format is just way too short to properly tell an entire season of content. As of yet, we have 3 seasons that follow this 13 episode trend, and it's no wonder that all 3 of them are at the bottom of this list. Like I said, I debated whether I should put this season on the number 5 or number 4 spot, but whereas I certainly have some complaints with the next season too, at least it has the advantage of having 26 episodes that allow most characters to get the proper development they need. This season gives us a meager half of what we have gotten in prior seasons, and because of that there is a certain lack of development caused mostly because the show didn't get to take its time. This is made even worse by the fact that this season introduces an entirely new cast. If you would have given us yet another season with the original cast, I can understand why you'd settle for a shorter season. You can tell a few shorter stories with one or two larger ones and wrap up a few lingering plot lines that way. It's far less of a crime in All Stars because we already know who these people are. Revenge of the Island, however, introduces all new characters and we cannot simply skip over their introduction. 
It forces the pace to an undesirably high level, in which case we cannot flesh out the stereotypical characters this shown is known for, but instead are just left with that, stereotypes. Except for a few, most of the characters in Revenge of the Island have no significant changes to their personalities and don't get to fully live through the development that their premise sets up. Especially minor characters like Dawn and Brick are kicked off before they are used to their full potential and it's just infuriating! Because you know these characters are fun, you've gotten a taste of what they could achieve if given the room to flourish, but they don't get that! And yes, Pakatu Island makes the same mistake, but Pakatu Island had much larger flaws than a shortage of episodes. The big difference is that Pakatu Island would still not have been good if given 26 episodes, whereas Revenge of the Island would have gone from good to really gosh darn amazing! I don't really get why the writers feel this need to stick to a certain amount of episodes anyway. Yeah, 13 is half of 26, so what? I think having an additional 3 episodes to bump up the total to 16 would already make such a world of difference. Want to assure a non-elimination round in episode 1 so that we can actually get the chance to meet our new cast before diving head first into eliminating them? Want to separate our mergers from the pre-merge and to give each of the remaining 6 characters a chance to grab our attention and increase the stakes of what's to come? And an additional one in which you can create some drama without elimination and rise the nail biting even further. This one can be placed wherever, but my preferred placing would either be before the double elimination of Brick and Anne Maria, or just before the final four to increase the tension a bit more, similar to what Island and World Tour have done. Anyway, once you get the time to see some of these characters develop and interact, this cast is really endearing. There's 13 characters here, but let's be honest, they're basically just 12 characters that matter. And before I talk about those, let's quickly discuss our 13 in a dozen Stacy. Stacy is a flawless character and I couldn't be more serious if I tried. Boy, have you lost your mind, cause I'll help you find it. Now, I know a lot of people think Stacy is one of, if not the worst character in total drama history. And I'm here to tell you that you are wrong. Stacy is the perfect throwaway character. She has one repetitive joke that gets stale very quickly, but seeing as she is eliminated immediately upon the start of the show, it fits perfectly in the role that she has to fill. Stacy is designed to be unlikable. The fact that you dislike her so much means she's doing her job perfectly. Just compare her to Joffrey of Game of Thrones. Both are annoying as all heck, but that's what makes them such good characters. And I hear you asking, but Bill, are you really saying that this one-dimensional, self-observed, head-splitting little skits thing is comparable to the multi-level evil coming from one of the most well-crafted annoying brats in all of television? And to that I would say, wow, rude. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. Both are meant to get under your skin, and in that department, they both succeed flawlessly. Other than that, Stacy's whole stick with her infinite family tree of amazing inventors is just really witty to me, and I love how oblivious she seems to be about the nonsense in her lies. Yeah, and my great 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 grandmother, she invented the subscribe button. Before that, people just had to stalk YouTubers around to stay up to date on their videos. And my great 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 granduncle, he invented YouTube. Before him, people used to have a life! But Stacy never overstays her welcome as she is instantly eliminated in episode 1. The writers know that Stacy is annoying and they double down on it by giving you the immediate satisfaction of seeing this exhausting character take the L by literally yeeting her from the show. Besides Stacy, every character competes in at least 3 episodes. Dakota is eliminated second, but she is still around in 9 of the 13 episodes, which I think was a great choice. It gives the other characters more time to develop without sacrificing on screen time with Dakota, as well as playing a big part in the story Dakota goes through. Imagine if B and Dakota would have swapped elimination order, it would have taken away from who we know B to be without majorly improving Dakota's time on the show. And since we're talking about Dakota anyway, what a great character this is! Dakota has a lot of depth to her character. She is presented as this one-dimensional stereotype of a character who craves for attention and likes to spend all her daddy's money. Basically, she's presented as Taylor. However, despite her unlikable traits, Dakota comes off as a really nice and cute character. Wait, did I say cute? FBI, open up! Ah! They managed to twist Dakota from an unlikable attention-seeking brat to an endearing character you can't not root for. And her voice actress does a great work at portraying and giving life to the character too. I know I haven't talked about the voices of the characters so far, and all in all I think most characters are casted pretty great or better, but there's just something about Dakota that really sells the character for me. Dakota is great, plus her budding and eventual romance with Sam is presented in such a hilarious and cutesy way. Wow, we have a lot in common. Why would you say something like that to me? No, no, I meant about the tech withdrawal. 
Trust me, you're nothing like me otherwise. Aw, oh, thanks! And to top it all off, she then turns into Dakota Zoid? <laughs> The entire eighth episode of Dakota turning into a freak of nature is just very funny to me. And it ends so cute with Sam still liking her and Dakota feeling all appreciated. I don't know man, it's just so wholesome, even though it's super weird. Don't think too hard about the repercussions of Dakota turning into a monster and just enjoy it while it's here. I've talked about a lot of these characters in the All-Star segment already, so I will quickly go over the recurring cast and what I think of them this season without trying to repeat myself too much. Uh, I guess that's what you get when the seasons keep dropping in quality. You have to talk about characters before you get to discuss their first appearance. This season waits a long time before merging the contestants, and I feel that's a good thing. As soon as we hit the merge, we're left with just six contestants and it just feels like a small but strong group is left. I've already shared my thoughts on the final six in my pocket to island segment but if i may reiterate myself here i think this battle between the six of them feels like anyone has a valid shot at the finale and it just rises the tension with every episode one of them drops out now knowing mike wins all stars i think it's a great decision to make him the first elimination of the merge here it not only feels like a good conclusion for his arc this season something that would take many rewatches to finally realize but it also shows the vulnerability of zomi and cameron gives zoe more motivation to fight scott and once again reaffirms how threatening Scott is as a villain. This next bit shouldn't really come as a surprise, but like many, Zoe is better here than she is in All Stars. Zoe is so delightfully innocent, she's just the best. To my knowledge, there are people here that really like her and people that really don't, but I can proudly say that I am on the former camp. Zoe was the relatable female protagonist of this season, and it was quite surprising to me that she didn't get to be in the finale. She's strong, clever, can fend for herself, and is super nice to all her fellow contestants. Zoe going all commando Zoe after hitting her all-time low was a great moment for her character as well, and it just made me love her even more. Wait, did I say love? I must say that I don't really like Lightning as a finalist. I get what they're going for in the Brain vs. Braun finale with Cameron, but I honestly think Joe would have made a better pick in this regard. She's more likable than Lightning, at least in my opinion, and had a better chemistry with Cameron, so seeing her in the finale with Cam would probably make me a lot happier than this. Though I also quite like her defeat at the hands of Cameron, but them finding pride in the fact that she trained the Bubble Boy to even make it this far. Cameron himself is a decent finalist, though a bit predictable. Still, I like him better here than in All-Stars. That's because they know what they want to do with the character here. And yeah, I guess Cameron is a pretty cliche character, but cliches exist for a reason. Seeing this character that is super fragile and spent his whole life in the safety of a bubble try to overcome his biggest fears and prove himself is a tried and true underdog story that is guaranteed to attract people rooting for him. I appreciate that Sam got a chance to return for a second season, even though his inclusion in All-Stars was a weird decision and that his time there was poorly utilized. If he wouldn't have gotten to return, I think he would definitely have been one of my most requested characters to reappear in the show, alongside Don and Brick. While he's pretty funny by himself, his best moments are clearly with Dakota. The two of them are great together and I adore their little moments. Usually the relationships in Total Drama are relatively predictable, but this one caught me off guard on my first watch. And finally we have Scott, the great antagonist to this new cast. His plan to sabotage his own team is something we haven't really seen before. Well, unless you count DJ and World Tour, but that wasn't really his fault. Scott almost takes on the role of an imposter, though I do wonder how far he has this plan thought through. He claims to give the other team a false sense of security, but like, if they keep losing, he will eventually be in the minority in the merge and they'll just vote him off there, right? Not to mention that he has to keep up the charade that every time their team loses, it's not his fault, but someone else's. Anyway, unlikely as his plan may be, it still nets him a fourth place, after which he is brutally mutilated. Yeesh, and they play it off as a joke, but my guy could have sustained major permanent injuries from this. Look at the state he's in! His dynamic with Fang is pretty fantastic as well. I'll let myself out. It shows that Scott has the potential to be a comic relief character as well, something that was more explored in All Stars. Oh yeah, and remember how in the Pocket Island video I said that Clucky was my favorite non-competing side character? Yeah, yeah, scratch that, it's Fang. Fang is absolutely hilarious and he has so much personality for a side character and his continuous rivalry with Scott reminds me of Bugs Bunny and Elmer for some reason. Okay, over to the characters that weren't fortunate enough to make a return after this. B is a fine character, nothing more, nothing less. I like that his name is secretly Beverly, but mostly this guy is just set up as a strong powerhouse of a character to ultimately be cannon fodder to Scott's evil plans. 
Not much to say about this character, but I guess that's fitting considering the guy doesn't say a whole lot either. The same can be said for Dawn, the cannon father part, that is. She is set up as a very likable and weird character who has some great one-liners when she diagnoses the other contestants. I don't find it surprising at all that she's such a fan favorite in the community. It's just a shame that we never got to see any more of her. The only thing that really annoys me is how she is interrupted before she can out Scott as the traitor in their midst. This is such a lazy form of writing, just please never do anything like this again. Furthermore, Dawn is great for the short time she gets to be in the show. If you're looking for more Dawn content, just open any random fanfic on the internet and there's a high likelihood that she plays a big part in that. I don't have a whole lot to say about Anne Maria, I think she was a fine character. Her assassin has always got a few giggles out of me, but other than that she's pretty forgettable. This is one of those characters that don't get to do a lot more than the stereotype they are designed around. And I find it hard to believe that a character would use this much hairspray in real life. This is a super weird nitpick, I know, and it wouldn't have bothered me at all if they actually did something fun with it. For example, if she had to use it in an episode to seal something shut or something, but she was too vain to do it and she had to overcome her selfishness to help her team. It's a shame that they don't go for something more interesting. And because of that, it's just... Well, she's a girl that uses a lot of hairspray, I guess. The episode where Ezekiel praises her is very funny though. But nevertheless, she is probably the weakest character here besides B. Yes, I am aware Stacy is in this season. <laughs> but Brick, on the other hand, is such a likable character. It's such a shame he didn't get to return for another season. I especially like his interactions with Joe, and I think it would have been great to see more of them in All Stars. Brick also has some great visual jokes in his animation. I don't know, characters that look cross-eyed like this always get a good chuckle out of me. Gravity Falls does this all the time and it's one of the many reasons why I like that show so much. I don't think there are a lot of people who dislike Brick and with such a humble and honest personality I can totally see why. It's fitting for this character to get booted out because he stayed behind to help the other team and this makes me want a return of him even more. While we're on the topic of characters, I quickly want to say that I think this season is the one where Chef starts to become more and more of a background character. His influence in World Tour wasn't the biggest either, but here it really started becoming noticeable how little Chef was featured in the episodes. Though there were still some great moments with him, like the episode where he's tossed to go hunt down the others with his meatball cannon, and then accidentally pushes Zoe into becoming Commando Zoe. The appearances of the original cast of special guests were nice, but I didn't think they added much value to the season. In most cases they just felt like references for references sake. Shoehorned in to distract us from the other cast and remind us of the fun times we had with the original cast. Isn't it ironic how only four of the nine special guest characters are considered special enough to join the cast of All Stars? The only special guest I really enjoyed was Heather in episode 10. She adds a lot to the already amazing free-for-all that's going on in this episode, and I love how she just up and steals the blimp with the money because she never received her prize in World Tour. Savage as always. Other than Heather, the special guests just don't live up to the real deal, and I would much rather just see the original cast in their own seasons. But I'll get to those once I'm done foreshadowing the next episode. Finally, I quickly wanted to touch on Camp Omanaqua and how great it is to see this location again. I think without Revenge of the Island and All-Stars taking place here, this would still be the most iconic location of the entire show, but those seasons help cement that thought even further. I enjoy the fact that us not having seen this place in a long time is used in-universe to show how the island has been neglected over the last few years. There are some nice little callbacks to island's locations, such as the cliff dive in Boney Island, but I wish they'd have done a bit more with the concept. The mutation that is now on this island is pretty wild to it. It might be a bit absurd for some people, but I quite enjoyed the weird animal designs they kept coming up with. Especially Fang, like I said. The sharks in Total Drama were pretty anthropomorphic already anyway, so Fang is just basically them embracing the concept fully and giving a recognizable face to the idea. All in all, I think this was a great season. The pacing could feel a bit rushed, but even within the limited time frame, the season has managed to introduce us to a lot of great characters with a lot of potential and some really nice payoffs in the end. The theme of this season was alright as well, it made Total Drama a little more fantastical and gave up on some of the realism, but they managed to utilize the radioactive themes to their fullest potential. For real, a lot of people suffer from radioactive poisoning in this season. Oh well, we're probably not going to see the mutated cast again anyway. But that is going to do it for today, guys. Looking at the script, I'm guessing that this is going to be the shortest video in the series. Which is quite ironic, since my main complaint was that this season isn't long enough. But who knows? Well, I guess you do, since you can check the duration of this video.
but I'm still writing the script, so I only know once I created all the videos, which is also when you will know, because you won't be seeing it before then, so I guess still nobody knows. At least not while writing this script. Y yeah, yeah, good talk, okay. Thank you so much for sticking it out to the end again. If you're still watching at this point, you're probably enjoying what you're watching. Either that, or you're really deep asleep. Shh, don't let me wake you up. I'll just pop up again once the next video hits autoplay. If you're not sleeping though, please consider liking this video and subscribing to the channel. Again, I'm really curious about your thoughts about this and other seasons, so leave those in the comments below. Tomorrow I'll be back with part 4 out of 7. I won't tell you which one it is, but here's a little sneak preview for just those loyal fans still watching. Uh, Owen's competing in this one. But thank you ever so much for watching. This has been Silly Billy, and remember to always check for the McLean seal of approval. Howdoop!